What do they do a great job this, this morning? It's really uplifting. And they got, I think they have one more. I, I do know they have one more song here at the end. And so as I'm coming this morning, I was just thinking this morning that uh, we often think it's a right to have political freedom. And yet when we study history, we understand that most of the people who have lived on this earth over the centuries have lived in some sort of political bondage. And so we are indeed privileged. And so it's not only a right, but it's also a privilege as well. And so you're thinking to yourself, well, we're in church this morning. How does this all tie in together uh, to the gospel message and the church? Well, normally uh, I would come on Sunday morning and, and preach and teach really the Bible to uh, the believer, keeping everyone in mind, of course, that has, has come here. But this morning, I really want to just relate. And I would say in closing, doesn't that make you feel better? I'm saying in closing, all right, in closing, I just like to tie all these uh, ends together that we've talked about this morning. And I want to turn to a, a passage in the Bible. If you have your Bibles, if not, I'm going to read it anyway in John chapter 8, where it talks about the truth shall set you free. You know, we can have political bondage or political freedom and still be in spiritual bondage. We can have emotional bondage. You know, you're, you're a slave to, to worry, to fret, to depression. We can have... Uh, alcoholism, we can have drug addiction, there's pornography addiction as well, all kinds of addictions that we have in this world. And we're, we're really sometimes can become slaves to our habits, to our actions in life, as they just get kind of more and more difficult to deal with in life. And so we not only want to be set free on the outside, but we want to find a way also that God provides that we can be set free on the inside. And so with that, I'd like to read in this passage this morning in John chapter 8 as Jesus' words to the people that were following him and surrounding him. But Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in me and my word, the Bible, abides in you, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. They answered him, we are offspring <clears throat> of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is that you say you will become free? Then Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. And the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you'll be free Indeed. Well, we look at this passage and Jesus is saying to us, anyone who practices sin is a slave of sin. Well, who does not practice some sort of sin in their life? He's really talking about habitual and, and he's just simply saying to us that we need a rescue. You know, when we look at America and where we've come from, we understand as we look at the video just a few moments ago, that there was a problem in America and the colonies. We weren't free and we needed to be rescued, and so we had to fight for our freedom. In the same way, spiritually, there's a need as well. We're born into this world in innocence, but because of Adam's sin, that sin nature is within us, and we begin to sin early in life, and we continue to act selfishly, continue to put someone on the throne besides God, and the Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means I've sinned, you've sinned, we've all missed the perfect mark that perfection mark that God has set before us. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, I obey the Ten Commandments. Well, come, come on, Pastor, I just keep the big ten, and if I do that, I'm covering a lot of ground. Well, let me just remind you, it only takes one thing to make you a sinner, one sin to make you a sinner, just like it take, would take maybe if you murdered someone or whatever, it'd only take one to make you a, a murderer. But look at the Ten Commandments. The Bible says you shall put no other gods before me. Have you ever put anything in front of God? I know I have. I've probably been guilty of that a little bit this week, maybe even. And so we've done that before. And so immediately we've broken the first commandment. Then it says, don't put any other, don't build any uh, idols. Don't make idols in your life. Well, as an idol, it's anything you worship ahead of God. Now you've gone from, from putting God, no longer putting God first to actually putting an idol there. Then it talks about don't lie. Has anybody lied before? The Bible says, don't steal. Has anybody stolen before? The Bible says this, don't covet what your neighbor has. How many of us have, have not done that? 
And so when we look at the Ten Commandments, we've really broken every single one of them. Either, either we've done it physically or we've done it in our mind and heart. And so the Bible says, because of that, something happens to us. We become enslaved to that. I, I love the illustration that Charles Spurgeon told uh, a couple of centuries ago, I guess, or 150 years ago, about the king calling the blacksmith in and tell, tells him, he said, I want you to make a chain, a big linked chain for me. So the blacksmith goes out and obeys the king, brings back the chain, and the king is dissatisfied. Not long enough. Make it twice as long. And so the blacksmith goes and works and works, brings back the chain twice in length, and the king says, it's still not long enough. Go out and double it again. So the blacksmith goes back to his shop. Months later, he brings in a chain so heavy that he has to have help to bring it in. And the king seems satisfied. And he says, now, he turns to the other subject. He says, I want you to bind the man with the chain that he's made. Well, Spurgeon would tell you that the, the king in this, in this story is the devil. And he tells us to go and go and go and go. And pretty soon, the things that we've done actually bind us into habits, into addictions, and things that we don't want. You see, I love my freedom. How many of you love freedom? Oh, raise your hand. But how many of you don't like necessarily like everybody else's freedom? Raise your hand. I don't. I don't because sometimes their uh, exercise of freedom is a crime. Their exercise of freedom is, is a wrong thing to do. They, it infringes upon my freedom. What do we have in result of this? We have shootings in the schools. We have in slavery, sex slavery all over the world now that our young people are fighting against. We have alcohol addiction. We have drug addiction. We, we have all kinds of crime uh, uh, committed against us many times because of those things. And so we see a world where sin is, is sort of taking its course. And we're saying, we're saying to ourselves, I'm not free inside. In fact, I'm kind of fearful on the outside. What is the solution? Well, just like the 13 colonies, they had to have a solution to their problem. Now, what, uh, what was read just a few moments ago in this film, that uh, this declaration made by Richard Henry Lee before they voted, said this, that these United, resolved that these United States, or colonies, are of right, ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Well, the die was cast, but the war was to come. You notice in that film, beautifully depicted about the heart of the people that were in there, suddenly everything became silent because they knew what the resolution meant. What has happened? We fought for, for war in a war to win our freedom, and we've been fighting for it ever since. In the Revolutionary War, 8,000 plus people gave their lives. In the Civil War, it was 620,000 plus people gave their lives. World War I, 117,000. World War II, about 405,000. The Korean War, 36,000. Vietnam War, 58,000. Persian Gulf War, 383. Iraqi War, the 4,287. Afghan War, 2,321. These, these people sacrificed, these men and women sacrificed, and for every one of them, there were parents that were hurting. Maybe a spouse that was hurting. Children lost their mom or dad. It, it was a sacrifice that sometimes we cannot understand. But we keep sacrificing. Why? Because we want our freedom and we have to keep on fighting when called upon for that freedom. But spiritually speaking, Jesus Christ died once and for all for all of our sin. The Bible says God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says the life, now get this, the life of the flesh, the Bible says, is in the blood. Scientists did not understand that for several, uh, really, thousand years until they understood that once you run out of blood, you're dead. You run out of so much blood, you're dead. But the Bible said that many, many years ago, centuries ago. And the Bible says without the shedding of blood, without the giving of blood off, there's no forgiveness of sin. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. The blood that came from his hands, feet, and brow was a sign that God was pouring out his life for us, that he was giving 
that ultimate sacrifice for us, not just because he loved us, though he did, and he demonstrated that love for us, and that why we were sinners, we were against him, we were going our own way, he was not on the throne of our life at all, he still died for us, but he died for a reason, and that is to take away our sin, to take away the bondage that we experience in life. So how is all this done? How, how do we receive Christ? How do we get him into our heart? Of course, naturally, nas- nationally, again, we have to keep on fighting, but Jesus paid it all. So how do we get it? Well, we've got to work on hard enough, right? We've got to do rituals in the church, right? We've got to go, certainly we've got to go to church, right? We, we've got to do the things, we've got to live a good life. But here's what the Bible says. By grace are you saved. Grace is God's undeserved favor. We have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. Your salvation cannot be, he says, of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. You see, if I could work my way to heaven, I could boast. I could get to heaven and say, God, I didn't need you. I didn't need a Savior. I didn't need Jesus. That's just about like us as Americans saying, I didn't need all these soldiers to die for me. I've got my own way to political freedom. No, it would have never worked. You you couldn't have done it by yourself. It was an impossibility. At the same time, we cannot die for our own sins. We can pay for them, and that's the choice that we have. We can pay for our own or allow Jesus Christ to do it for us. You say, well, I think I've got my own way, and I'm sincere. I'm very sincere in my approach to God, and I feel kind of close to him sometimes. Well, sincerity doesn't always make it. Our middle child, our youngest son, is... um, a, um, a chaplain for Oxford University over in England. When he first went to England, he and his wife and, and youngest and our, their oldest son, um, they, they parked themselves in Scotland, St. Andrews, beautiful little town. Well, you have to fly into London and you have to take a train all the way up to St. Andrews, which is about a six, six and a half hour train ride. And, you know, normally you would say, oh, what a pleasant ride. And it was it's beautiful. Well, it was beautiful, it wasn't pleasant. People were getting on, people were getting off, you were jammed, uh, stacked up. You had to find a seat that wasn't taken because people paid for them in advance. You had your luggage stuffed over it. Every stop I had to check my luggage because somebody might just set it off and not put it back on. And so I'm, we're going through all this and every, every time we stop, we have to change trains. We have to look around and ask questions because they don't have the signs on the buses on where they're going. And so... Um, I was asking someone, and our luggage was right there uh, next to where the train would pull up. Suddenly a train pulls up, and every train at this point had been right on time, and it was on time. So I just grabbed the bags. I said, Pam, this, this is it. So I jump on. She says, well, I'm not sure, but I, I, I jump on. I wait a few, because I'm looking around for a seat. You know, I'm looking, I'm looking. All of a sudden, the door shut behind me, and I said, where do you want to sit? No answer. Well, I look behind me, and the train's pulling off with her on the sidewalk, Okay. <laughs> Now, I'd like to say that I left, left her behind and I, I was on the right train, but 30 seconds later I realized I had been the one that jumped on the wrong train and she eventually got on the right one. Now, I have to say that, I don't wanna say that, but I have to say that, you know, that she, she did get on the right one and beat me to the place that we were going. But see, I was sincere. Every single stop along the way, I, I was sincere. I was extremely sincere, but I, I was sincerely wrong. I got on the wrong train. So how do, you, how do you fix all this? Jesus, salvation belongs to God. And so he has the right to say, this is how you do it. And sometimes we think salvation is like, all, like this room. He's got, what, eight, nine doors you can come in. Oh, there's, uh, you know, the, the, the Catholic door and the Baptist door and the Methodist door and, and the atheist door and this door and all these other doors that you can jump in. But God says there was no door. Hey, you're separated from God. Somebody's got to pay for your sin. There is no door. John 10, just a couple of chapters later than this, uh, than this chapter that I'm reading from today, said that Jesus is the door. Jesus died on the cross, and that's the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father by me. He says, I am the door. If you're going to come in, you've got to come through the Jesus door. And it's real simple. Even a child can understand it. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Wow. 
And that's all you have to do. You call on the Lord. You call on the Lord and surrender, humbly surrender your heart to Him and ask forgiveness of your sin. There's no ritual you have to do. There's no place you have to go in the world. There's no work you have to do. No, it's, it's just all of grace. Romans 10, 13 tells us in the Bible, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what about you today? You know, we can talk about, you know, some Christians are here and they're saying, wow, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm not, I haven't, I haven't gained control of some of the things in my life. Salvation gives you the freedom from the penalty of sin. Jesus paid it all. Salvation also gives you the power to overcome sin. But it is the power. It is the capability. And as you grow as a Christian, those things become more and more conquered. But I'm talking about this morning the foundational principle of getting free from the penalty of sin and getting on the track of worshiping the one true God. What about you today? If you were to die today, do you know you go to heaven? Do you know that you're forgiven? Do you know you've been set free? If not, I want to give you an opportunity this morning just to simply call on the Lord Jesus Christ. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you've never received him into your heart or you have doubts this morning that you are a believer, I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me silently as I pray aloud. Would you pray with me now? Lord God, I know that I'm a sinner. I fall short. I don't worship you necessarily first in my life. But I know that Jesus died for all my sins. And I want him to forgive me now of everything that I've done and come into my heart to set me free. In Jesus' name, amen.